Tea time. Welcome everybody! Soden of the Grin Brothers here, and it's time for another episode of Tea Time. I haven't had a proper day, uh, a proper night's sleep this entire week. I've been staying up to 2 a.m. pretty much every day of this week to get Nanka's Pokemon Me vs. Adventure finished. Uh, and of course, along with that, I've been staying up to past 11 p.m. to record these tea times and a lot of other things, and uh, I am exhausted. Oh, yeah, I can't stop. Calendar opened it up. There's a new tea to talk about. And uh, I'm interested in trying this because, uh, thank gosh, it doesn't have mint in. It is the uh, today's tea is the berry savory pie tea. It's a herbal tea. You'd think it'd be called a fruit tea, but no, the English tea shop call it a herbal tea. Uh, brew time is three to five minutes. And the information on it enjoy this merry and fruity rubos tea that is packed with apple pieces, raspberries, blueberries, cranberries, and cinnamon. Because as we all know, cinnamon is the greatest berry ever. And uh, I've currently got it here black, uh, well, without milk, and it currently smells like blades of grass. You'd think that a tea packed with so many berries would smell nicer, but no, no, it just smells like grass, which is um, hardly the nicest uh, smelling uh, drink, but it's not, well, for someone who has hay fever like myself, but it's not like it's a bad smell. <laughs> In any case, uh, for today's tea time, today's tea time is uh, actually inspired by the tea time I did with uh, Beerbop, the uh, collab tea time, uh, in the fact that she grew up, uh, it was about, you know, games we grew up with and systems we grew up with, and she ended up talking a lot about the PS2. And at the time, I had a hard time recording my memories of the PS2. There was more Rafi's generation of uh, gaming. However, I do uh, I did play the PS2 a fair amount. It was a Gen 6 system I did play because Rafi often had it set up to play Ratchet and Clank games. So I figured, hey, let's do another top list. So here is Solden's top six PS2 games. That's almost a snappy title. I think the Solden part kind of extends it a bit. But then again, Tea Time is shorter to put into the uh, title than Grim Brothers. So maybe I'll be able to fit in Solden's top six PS2 games. But hopefully, which I've listed here as P22. I didn't, I forgot the S. <laughs> I've been having a great amount of difficulty with uh, this tea time, which is why it's taken so long to actually do this tea time. And that's because I easily thought of my sixth favourite game and my first favourite game. I easily thought of my top six favourite games in all. And while six and one were really solidly put, I couldn't decide between five and two. Um, the games I had, the order they were in. So this isn't, you know, the most solid of lists. Six and one I feel very comfortable with. Five to two, I feel like they could be in of, um, in uh, differing order, but I've placed them in a certain order because of reasons uh, I feel will make sense. In any case, let's begin Solden's top six uh, PS2 games, or as I've written it down here, Solden's top six P22 games. In number six, and speaking of games that Rafi played on the system, my sixth favourite PS2 game is Ratchet & Clank 3. Now, I had a bit of an internal struggle with this one because I also really liked Ratchet and Clank 2. It's what introduced me to the Ratchet and Clank series for a PS2 demo disc I played. And I particularly enjoyed some of the extras that Ratchet and Clank 2 has, such as the spaceship battles and the giant Clank robot fights, which are pretty much absent in Ratchet and Clank 3. Well, there is one giant robot fight, but that's it, really. And there's no, you, know, you can customize your spaceship, there's no spaceship battles in Ratchet and Clank 3. What kind of makes it work better for me in terms of Ratchet Clank 3 is kind of how the story's put together. There's a much more solid cast of supporting characters and the uh, you get to explore Quark as an ally, which I think is far more interesting than having Quark as a villain. And of course it sets up the main antagonist of the series, recurring antagonist of the series, Dr. Nefarious. And I feel those elements, having a, you know, iconic main villain and having a sort of decent, well-rounded sort of cast of characters, which I felt could have been focused on a lot more in future games, though they never, they kind of uh, pushed them to the wayside. <laughs> yeah, I felt that was a really good direction for the game in terms of a story and means. And of course, the gameplay is really, really solid. Like I said, there's a lot of extra stuff in Ratchet and Clank 2 I really miss. However, the core gameplay in Ratchet and Clank 3 is just as good, if not slightly better than Ratchet and Clank 2. It's more, you know, polished and some really good level design. You know, the search for Quark in the jungle is really good. The um, Annihilation Nation sort of areas are always a ton of fun. And in general, it's just uh, Ratchet and Clank uh, games are pretty much all really solid core experiences. And um, Ratchet and Clank uh, 3 was no different. Really nice sort of storyline to it all. You know, it had really solid gameplay and then took it, in my opinion, to sort of the best sort of story path to take it through 
So you had the already amazing gameplay and you finally got a above decent sort of storyline to take the, to have the characters of Ratchet and Clank explore their way through. And there's a lot of, and I feel there's even more humor thanks to the supporting cast, meaning there's more characters to interact with. You also start off with Clank at the very beginning rather than having to deal with no Clank for the first few levels, which gosh, that is annoying. <laughs> So yeah, uh, Ratchet & Clank 3 is my 6th favourite PS2 game. And then we move on to the ones that I was having a bit of difficulty uh, starting out the order on. But my number uh, 5 favourite PS2 game is Digimon Rumble Arena 2. Digimon Rumble Arena 2 has its uh, f uh, problems, um, such as um, being able to select the uh, sort of like uh, mega Digimon and the sort of like vi legendary sort of like villain Digimon, which are kind of uh, overpowered compared to the rest of the cast. It's not a in super balanced fighting game, but it's an incredibly uh, a fun fighting game uh, with a sort of sort of a kind of a super. It has a Super Smash Bros. feel to it. In terms of it being a four-player party fighter with a uh, lot of item usage and Digivolution and all that. It has all of the Season 1 Digidestined uh, children's characters in it, as well as Gilmon, uh, a few other characters from uh, sort of Season 2, 3, and Season 4 at the time, with most importantly Nemon being the only non-mega, sort of like, non-digivolving Digimon in the game. And that's brilliant, because Nemon is hilarious, and the one redeeming factor to Season 4 of Digimon. <laughs> yeah, it's just a really fun game, filled with a lot of love to the Digimon series, some really fun levels, and I feel like a good Super Smash Bros. alternative. Uh, the reason I have it placed at number... F and I remember there being a few sort of like uh, fun little modes to play or, uh, play around with it. C comparing it to Digimon Rumble Arena 1 and 2, like the upgrade is significant. It's so much smoother. And of course, there's a four-player capability. Which, ironically, that four-player capability is why I only have this game at number 5. Because it's a game that needs four players to be enjoyed to its greatest potential. However, the PS2 doesn't come with four control ports naturally. Unlike every other Gen 6 console, the Dreamcast, the GameCube, and the Xbox all had full controller support, but the PS2 didn't. But yeah, really fun game, really enjoyable. Me and Rafi played it for hours upon hours, and uh, yeah, Digimon Rumble Arena 2 is my fifth favourite PS2 uh, game. Moving on to number four, and uh, much like with Digimon Rumble Arena 2 and Ratchet and Clank 3, this is kind of a game that I would have been interested to hear Raf's thoughts on, because Raf has an interesting uh, thought pattern with this series. My fourth favourite video uh, PS2 video game was actually one of the very last PS2 games I got. In fact, it might be the last PS2 game we purchased before we kind of moved on to sticking with like the further generations. Uh, oh wait, no, Ratchet and Clank was the very last one, and Raph has never actually played that first Ratchet and Clank game because we're missing a wire for the PS2. In any case, my fourth favourite PS2 game is Naruto Ultimate Ninja 2. I, for some reason, could never find Naruto Ultimate Ninja 1 or 3 or 4, but I was able to find Naruto Ultimate Ninja 2. And it's a really, really fun game. A sort of 2D fine game with uh, sort of a foreground and a background that you can switch back and forth between. Kind of like the Donkey Kong Country return level in um, Super Smash Bros. Uh, for Wii U. Except it's a much smoother transition between the two. You got a characters, a good sort of um, cast of characters covering from the uh, first arc to the end of the Tsunade arc. The storyline has some original moments. It's a bit weird. Um, like there's this attack on the uh, village after uh, Sonali becomes Hokage, Roro Chimaru summons like Zabuza and Haku. It was a interesting route to go with, um, but you know, like it was a very in-between game. But there's a lot of sort of good sort of mechanics to it. Um, the finisher moves you could enhance their powers by again you know, pressing the right button combinations. Uh, I remember there being like a cl uh, I remember uh, Kiris being a nightmare to deal with in the in. Uh, the game because he could always do those sort of things rapid fire. You were never going to outbeat a uh, do him on it. Like the persons who are being attacked can also defend themselves in that situation. There was items to collect, you know, and uh, a lot of fun characters overall. Um, the characters, you know, despite the 2D play and despite being a simple sort of uh, fire, again, uh, not maybe not full play, but again, that sort of Super Smash Bros. sort of uh, 2.5D sort of uh, lots of platforming sort of fighters, although very few pits to di uh, die off of sort of uh, situation. But yeah, so it was, you know, simple it was simple to execute, but a lot of fun and a lot of sort of cool things you could do with it and all. It had a lot of flashiness to it. It had a, considering when it took place uh, in terms of the storyline, it had a decently lengthy storyline to it with a few little mini sort of uh, mini games thrown in to uh, enrich the experience a bit more. And uh, yeah, um, the thing I said about Rafi uh, in particular being an interesting person to bring up with it, is that he actually really, really liked Naruto Ninja 2, but he didn't like the Naruto Ninja Storm games. He didn't like it when the series went from 2D to 3D, which is kind of interesting. 
I like both versions, both the 2D and uh, 3D Ultimate Ninja games. And Naruto Ultimate Ninja 2 is basically the last PS2 game I uh, played when we still sort of had the system set up and had a cable to actually, you know, play the PS2. Um, was a really good send off for me in regards to the system. Ironically, that happens a lot actually because I kind of finished off the PSP with a Naruto game as well. Huh, a strange pattern here. In any case, yeah. Moving on then, but yeah, in, as you may be able to see, I really enjoyed fighting games uh, on the system. Um, the PS2 was known for RPGs as well, which is my other absolute favourite genre, but I never actually played too many of them. The only one I played that I particularly enjoyed was, I think it was the Dragon Quest Eight, was it? Or was it not? No, it wasn't nine. I think it was Dragon Quest Eight. Quite enjoyed that one a lot, but anyway, anyway, anyway. On to number three, my third favourite PS2 game, and well... If, uh, if depending if I've uploaded these two times in the order I've recorded them, this one will be one that you may have heard me talk about before, so I won't delve too much into it. My third favourite PS2 game is Spider-Man 2. You know, there's there's little I can say which hasn't already been said. The webcanic, of, you know, even by myself, because I've covered this in a previous uh, tea time. Um, the webcanic uh, mechanic is fantastic, both from sort of swinging, the, the exhilarating feeling of swing, how smooth it felt, how quick it felt, how easy it was to get to grips with, how rarely you ended up sort of, unless in the small tight corners, ended up sort of like, uh, destroying your camera and sort of thing. Uh, the sort of combat, it's simple, but it's really engaging with a lot of combos that you can get. And whilst there are some situations where you kind of get mobbed on, there's usually a way, a sort of combo out of it that you probably haven't either A, unlocked, or B, isn't the sort of combo you often end up using sort of thing. You know, there's a lot of techniques to fit for every situation. It expands upon the Spider-Man 2 movie storyline fantastically with great character inclusions such as Mysterio and Black Cat, and um, includes some uh, really cool sort of uh, boss fights and all. And uh, it sort of like explores the story of Spider-Man 2 without... Uh, uh, you know, get, giving it greater details and new sort of like fanfare ideas without interfering with what the actual storyline of the Spider-Man 2 movie was. So, despite being a movie time game, Spider-Man 2 is my third favourite PS2 game. Then we go on to number two, my second favourite PS2 game, and as I said before, I really enjoyed fighting games on the system. Despite how the PS2 controller isn't, how, isn't my favourite, I'd say it was the last, really, uh, the good Sony one. Because I don't think the PS3 was that good of a controller and the PS4 I really don't like. Uh, but the PS2 is uh, another PS2 fighting game that I really liked. At number 2 is Dragon Ball Z Budokai 3. You may also notice there's a pattern here. Every game I'm mentioning here has either 2 or 3 at the end of it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Dragon Ball Z Budokai 3. The sort of last of the Budokai games before they went into the uh, free realm with the Tenkaichi series. Of course, they later made more 2D, 2.5D Budokai games with the PSP's Shin Budokai sort of entries. Um, and I believe there was like one really far out uh, PS2 Dragon Ball Z Budokai game, but it was like long after the system should really have been discontinued. Um, but Dragon Ball Z Budokai 3 is a fantastic sort of like uh, game building on the Budokai series of fighting games and uh, perfecting it in a sense. Uh, there are still the one or two odd issues, such as Gohan only having a single special move, which is odd. But there's a you know there's an intuitive customization system involving capsules where you can customize your characters in many unique ways. Either try to give them all of their sort of move sets, or give them special abilities to give them the edge, or make them absolutely broken, like Raffi did with Freezer and just equipped him with Mecha Freezer capsule. The story mode is amazing because you actually get to kind of fly across the entire world of Dragon Ball Z as multiple different characters, customizing them not just with the capsules, but also uh, with an RPG level up system, increasing their base stats. And you explore lots of what if situations, situations such as if uh, Vegeta became a Super Saiyan uh, and fought Goku or Namek, or uh, even like expanded storylines with sort of Yantra and Tien, like the Yantra final fight is a really cool one where Yantra goes up against Vegeta in the World Martial Arts Tournament. And, um, Stuff like that. They heck, they fit in an entire Oob storyline, having Oob fight against Omega Shenron, and yeah, lots of uh, really sort of neat things like that. It's really fun exploring the sort of large world, you know, finding these uh, tons of little uh, fan sort of uh, loving moments. You know, you, uh, you can actually discover Launch in some of the areas, and there's some funny scenes with her and Tien. Stuff like that. Stuff like that. A lot of fanfare to it. There was and there were some characters who were a nightmare to deal with, such as Kid Buu, because he started off with so much Kai for the beginning of the fight. But otherwise, it's a it's a really um, as I've said with a lot of fighting games, really simple to understand, you know. Um, but it 
with less so than the current sort of Dragon Ball Z games. You may be familiar with where a lot of them are now kind of just like up and energy or down and energy. It was actually combos you had to do. It was uh, pretty much the last sort of combo intense sort of Dragon Ball Z game. It was really cool sort of uh, kind of going back to it and sort of seeing that. Sadly, both the copies of the game I've got are broken copies. So, like, can you imagine that? The copy we had broke and then we bought another copy and it was also broken. But yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I lo loved the uh, Dragon Ball Z Budokai 3 because of um, the story mode in particular, because of how it um, gave you a ton of characters, not just focused on uh, Goku and such. Allowed you to explore the story flying from different angles and um, allowed you a lot of uh, customization RPG mechanics within said storyline. And of course, the fighting system was uh, taking the Budokai series from 1, 2, and then 3, and 3 had kind of refined it to a really amazing point. Everything felt very smooth to it and all. So yeah. Dragon Ball Z Budokai 3 is my second favourite PS2 game. As I said, 5 to 2 were really tough decisions. Um, that took a long while for me to decide. But hey, like Spider-Man 2 was very close to being my second favourite. Um, Digimon Rumble Arena 2 and Naruto Ninja 2 kind of uh, shifted places a few times. Naruto Ninja 2 and Dragon Ball Z Budokai 3 even shifted places about. So yeah, it's been real tough deciding this. But before we move on to number four, I am going to try this tea. This, uh, was it, Merry Berry Tea? I took away the box and I threw away the book. Oh, wait, hold on. Yeah. My babe, uh, my, I was, was going to say babe, my berry savory pie tea. Okay, here we go. Okay, that's a bit better. That's a bit worse. That's a bit better. What's that term? Too many sh uh, cooks in the kitchen? Um, I think that means uh, when too many people are working on something, it can be a bit of a disaster. But I think the way I'm trying to use this term is they tried to add too many different... You know, they thought, oh man, I really like cranberries and I really like raspberries. Let's throw them into this tea. And then they put blueberries and cinnamon and they cram too much stuff in. The flavours kind of all muddle up at the start and it's... It's not bad. Just confusing. Like, you don't get a strong taste of anything or any of them, really. You get a bit of, like, a, a bit of raspberry taste at the end, which is nice. The aftertaste is... Decent enough, but then it gets really muddled up with all the different flavors. It's um, they're all kind of fighting each other. It's like when you try to mix a bunch of uh, paints together, and it just kind of makes that weird murky color. Not bad, but not you know something I choose to drink. Mm. Yeah, maybe they should have thrown in some I don't know pie crust flavoring whilst they're at it <laughs> to make it truly a pie tea, very savory pie tea. <laughs> In any case, that was a very savory type tea, and now we move on to my number one favorite PS2 game. And when you hear this, it may explain, it may help you understand my uh, negative reactions towards a game we've covered on the channel through the Grin Brothers. Because my favorite PS2 game is Soul Calibur 3. And as you know, I um, was very disappointed with Soul Calibur 4. And extremely disappointed with Soul Calibur 5. And I think that kind of stems from the fact that I really absolutely loved Soul Calibur 3. It's weird, like, I got into the series because of the whole situation of Link being in the GameCube version of Soul Calibur 2. Um, it's uh, Silverwing mentioned it, and he was like, I'm going to buy that, I'm going to buy that. So he bought it because Link was in Soul Calibur 2, and it turned out to be a really fun game. And I ended up getting Soul Calibur 3. I'm not sure if it was like a whim or something. I just like saw it and it's like, oh, it's PS2 only. That's a bit of a shame. But I got it and then I played it to... I played it tons and tons. It's my most played game on the PS2 easily. Um, I played through the arcade mode with every single character and their sort of uh, story mode. The sort of single player campaign mode for the game, as it were, where you get to take your uh, the Soul Calibur character through the adventure. You get to make cho uh, you get to explore a world map, make choices which lead you to different paths, fight hidden bosses, some of which are insane. You have to fight like like a statue of of Zeus, you know, a giant stone statue. You're the size of his foot. And uh, you, know, you get attacked by bandits, poisoned in one thing. You unlock sort of special characters in like a sub menu. Some of which are referencing past games. So others are just like the shopkeepers you're buying equipment from. 
And like, you know, you get quick time events which uh, influence the fight. You start off a little bit injured or change the path a bit. Or in some cases with the ending quick time events, change what ending you get. Lots of really cool different endings. You got lots of different, uh, thanks to the story mode, you know, sort of uh, taking, you, you know, having like effectively a page of written dialogue between each fight allows you to see a lot more character interactions. And that's fantastic. It's one of my favorite. It's probably my utmost favorite thing in terms of writing. To make a good story, you have to have solid character interactions, I feel. And Soul Calibur 3 nails that. It's Soul Calibur 3 is kind of the pinnacle. No, maybe not the absolute pinnacle, but it was kind of what I've always wanted from a fine game. Because it's a fine game which basically is, has an arcade mode uh, with um, some slight variations, but otherwise the same end goal. It's not overly long. At that same time, though, it has a uh, it has plenty of character actions and flesh out the story and the world through little sort of uh, cutscenes or little pages of dialogue between each fight. But it never feels like it's uh, you're never waiting too long, sort of it. So it's short. It's got a storyline which is short, sweet, but delves into everything that a good story should do. And it's kind of what I feel fighting games should have for their arcade mode. There should be a character interaction between each round of an arcade mode. Or ways you can influence it so you fight specific people in an arcade mode. And lately they've been try uh, fighting games have been trying to alter the story too. It's like this big grand sort of thing where you don't even get to select your character at a certain point. And you just you follow a very subset storyline. But I loved how Soul Calibur 3 handled things in the story uh, department. The gameplay was um, lots of fun. I was able to uh, master myself with quite a few characters. A guard counter system worked really well. Um, I managed to you know, push back a lot of enemies and such. Again, the game offers tons of challenges for those hidden fights. Oh my gosh, they are insanely stuff. I got only recently discovered through watching Maximilian Dude videos that there's like this, you can actually fight like the nightmare uh, super form, night terror. Like I didn't think you even had to fight that, but apparently you can if you like do hard mode, beat like a special enemy in like a dark dungeon sort of thing. It's like insane requirements, but, and you know, not losing a life and wow. Yeah, you could get tons of different weapons. There was like a giant sort of sub-menu campaign with like an SRPG element to it. And it also introduced the character customization. And it was the best character customization the series has ever had because it because the moveset you had were all original base sort of movesets. Like you pick the star fighting style and you think, oh, it's gonna be Keelig. But no, you swing your you do a charge attack of the weapon and it suddenly expands and it's like, oh my gosh, I'm you know, got the Neo bar. I can make this sort of like stick extend or make it turn into a giant log and all that, and uh, they had a ton of unique sort of uh, weapon styles not represented by playable characters in the game, which were available through via customization or through some of the characters that the developers made themselves. Um, some of them, again, referencing past characters who they just didn't give a story mode to, such as Lee Long. But yeah, yeah, um, absolutely love Soul Calibur 3. Fantastic presentation, fantastic storyline, really fun, fine game system, and it introduced a lot of mechanics which have kind of become core to Soul Calibur. You know, everyone expects a character creator now. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it was the game I played the most on the PS2, and it's the game I enjoyed the most on the PS2. So Soul Calibur 3 is my favourite PS2 game. And okay then, we get to the end of this video, so... You know the usual. What did you think of my opinion here? What did you think of uh, my top six favorite PS2 games and how they're pretty much dominated by fighting games? What are some of your favorite PS2 games and what are your thoughts on the PS2 in general? I'd love to hear them. I'd love to chat with you and uh, love to discuss this topic. For now though, cheerio!